All right, Alexander, let's talk about what's going on at the European Union. And uh, we've got all the EU uh, leaders. They're, uh, they're meeting and they're talking about all kinds of issues. And uh, one of the big issues is what do you do about Russia? What to do about Russia? My God, the evil Russia, Alexander. What should they do? France and Germany, they want, uh, they want to talk to the... Uh, to the Russian regime, as they call it, the regime in Russia. And they want to try to find a way to bring Russia on side. But you have the uh, the other countries, the hardline countries, the countries that want to punish Russia. What do you say hardline? Like uh, Lithuania and Poland and the Netherlands. They want to continue to punish Russia and put the full weight of EU sanctions and uh, EU power towards Russia so that they can make the Russians behave in a proper way. They want to change the Russians' behavior and uh, make it more congruent with those EU values. So, of course, the whole thing's silly, Alexander. I, I still don't understand why they just don't talk to Russia and just start working things out. Anyway, the, get, get into this story. I mean, it's a, it's a fascinating story in so many ways. It's not about talking with Russia, because, I mean, that's going to happen in some form or other. But it shows, again, the extent to which the EU is now a prisoner of its original decisions, those extraordinary stupid decisions it took back in 2013, 2014, to precipitate a crisis in Russia, with Russia, over Ukraine and other issues, which means now that it's become effectively on this particular topic captured by an extreme hardline minority. Because you mentioned the Germans and the French now sort of have come round to the fact that this whole policy of not talking to Russia, the biggest, most powerful country in Europe, the one with the, by, by, you know, the biggest economy, by far the biggest military, the biggest technology base, the country that's now aligning increasingly with China, the country that's causing them so many problems. I mean, obviously they have to talk to it, but they find that they are, one, trapped within the EU institutional structure, which they created because they've delegated all of these important decisions to the EU on so many issues, on foreign policy, on trade policy, on all those kind of things. So they're trapped within the EU structures. They can't really break out of it and talk about talk to Russia without getting the agreement of the minority of hardline states. And it's important to stress we're talking about a very small minority. We're talking about Poland, possibly Romania to some extent, the Baltic states, obviously, and the Netherlands, which has similar hang-ups to Russia as Britain, Britain does. And they're able to to control Germany and France and Italy and Spain and uh, you know most of the countries of Europe, which are ac becoming increasingly anxious to talk to Russia. So they've, they've created an institutional trap for themselves and they've created a political trap for themselves because they can't talk to Russia through the EU structures without breaking this sacred principle of unanimity, which, of course, they always impose on the others in nearly every other kind of scenario. At the same time, they have they feel the p political imperative to do it. Now, I'm going to make a prediction. Sooner or later, what's going to happen is that the hardliners, Poland, the Baltic states, the Netherlands, are going to have to bend. Because, realistically, if the Germans, the French, the Italians the, uh, 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 and all those countries want to talk to Russia in some format they will and I'm sure it will be pointed out to these countries that it is in their interests that it happened through the EU structures the not because if the Germans and the French and all those other countries start dealing with Russia and negotiating directly things like trade for example then um, not only will the EU, EU start to crack, but of course they will be left out in the cold. So that's something which I suspect they will have to be brought round to doing. But it shows the double folly, if you like, 
Firstly, trapping your own foreign policy in institutional structures which prevent you from making decisions which might be in your interests. And secondly, once you've created those kind of institutional structures, like, as the most um, unbalanced <laughs> and, and uh, uh, reactionary uh, and, and Russophobic person you could possibly find who, who can't uh, get over the various issues he has and who won't let you go. <laughs> so, I mean, it shows you how misguided the whole strategy, both in institutional and in political terms, has been for the last... Uh, well, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, whatever. It also shows you that, uh, well, two things that I noticed from this. The first one is that the EU thinks they're more powerful than what they really are, because my hunch is that Russia is just saying, look, we're open for business. You guys want to trade? Let's trade. You guys don't want to trade? No problem, we'll go elsewhere. It is a very big world, contrary to the propaganda that we're fed every day, especially as European citizens. We're fed the propaganda that there's nothing outside of the European Union. And if the EU doesn't exist, well, then the sun won't rise. It's completely false. There's a very, very big world. And uh, there's a lot of trade to be had. So Russia's saying you want to trade? It's a natural fit. We're next to each other. Let's trade. Let's do business. You don't want to trade? We're a big country. We have a lot of neighbors. We'll work things out and uh, we'll find other people to do business with, other countries to do business with. That's the first thing. So the EU thought they're so powerful. They're so powerful. We can put sanctions on people and we can impose our, our glorious EU values on the entire world. And they're going to succumb to our pressure because we're this big, powerful European Union. And I think they're realizing that they're actually a bunch of uh, weaklings and cowards. That's the first thing. And the second thing is, as you said, um, the whole uh, we have to do things together as a group solidarity is complete BS. I mean, complete BS. Why does it, it it just it destroys a country and it destroys their citizens and it destroys the, the prospects and the growth of, of each member state country. If, if Germans want to do business with Russians, do business. And if Lithuania or Netherlands is having a stink about it, screw them. I mean, that's what I would say. The same thing goes for Greece and the same thing goes for Lithuania. You want to do business, do business, man, as a country. If other countries are throwing a, a stink about it, so be it. I, I absolutely agree. I completely agree with the last point. And can I just say on that last point, it's just as well that the Germans and the French have now been read this lesson because they are the ones who up to now have been imposing this concept of European solidarity on everybody else. In Greece, we've seen, the, we've seen what it means. We've seen how a country can become trapped. And for the first time in foreign policy, the Germans and the French are discovering that the, that the institutions which they thought would imprison everybody else on this issue they are imprisoning them. So it's a lesson that they need to learn and they need to learn fast because, of course, sooner or later, it's going to bite them and it's going to bite them in a far worse way than this is because dragging along every single member state um, is going to create enormous pressures. I mean, already you can guess the kind of threats that are being said in the background and the kind of hard words that are being exchanged. I mean, when uh, Mark Rutte, the, pro the Prime Minister of the Netherlands, said, you know, by all means, call Putin to an EU summit meeting, an EU council meeting, but don't expect me to be there in that case. In other words, he's going to boycott an EU council meeting. That's what he's threatening to do. Now, that suggests a tight Titanic row on this issue, and one can one can ask what exactly did the EU say to him that that uh, boxed him in on this position in that kind of a way? That's that's so you know there's huge rows. This isn't creating more conciliatory feelings in Europe. It's making for more tension in Europe. But well, that's one thing. Now the other thing, which is the point that you just made now about you know the EU and Europe imagining conceiving of itself as being the great economic, political, moral superpower that dominates everything. And um, you are absolutely right. Back in 2014, when they imposed all those sanctions on Russia, they never imagined they would be in this place. They assumed that within a couple of months, 
the Russians would have been brought to heel because, you know, they couldn't conceive of a situation where, uh, you know, Russia with its GDP, the size of the Galapagos Islands or whatever it is that they think it has, would be able to hold out against sectoral sanctions and all the things that the uh, EU imposed upon it. And again, it's a consequence of their own folly. They completely failed to see already the extent to which the world is changing, the way that Russia had changed since the 90s, the way, of course, the world, the greater world is changing also. And what they discovered instead is that Russia did survive perfectly well, despite the sanctions. And you summed up Russian views absolutely correctly. They said, well, look, if you want to do business, if you want to trade with us, if you want to do deals on all kinds of things, we're open for business, exactly as you described it, Alex. But if you don't, so be it. We've got other friends. We've got other trading partners. China is now uh, uh, rapidly, rapidly becoming as important to us in trade as the EU is. There's some distance to go, but we are, you know, in that situation where in five years' time they could easily have overtaken the EU and probably will have done because our trade with China is growing dynamically. Our trade with the EU is declining. By the way, another country with whom our trade is increasing dynamically as of this moment it will surprise many people in Europe to know that, probably, is the United States. <laughs> Russian-US trade is booming. Uh, uh, at the moment, Russia, the Americans, for all sorts of bad reasons, are <laughs> buying Russian oil. But that's, that's you know, well, I'm, I'm not going to go into all of that, especially with uh, the constraints on our channel. But, um, you know, it, it is a fact that US-Russian trading relations are booming. Of course, Russia has good trading relations with many countries now, with Koreas, with both Koreas, South Korea especially, um, Japan to some extent. I mean, you know, they're not constrained in the way that they used to be. So um, the EU thought that, you know, they you know huffed and puffed and blew strongly enough. The whole house of cards that they thought Russia was would come crashing down. Now they want to talk to it. They find that the Russians are, you know, always willing to talk because that's what the Russians do, but not very much on their own terms. And in the meantime, they find that they are trapped because countries like Poland, the Baltic states, the Netherlands don't want them to talk and they can't get through, can't get it done easily because of their own institutional structures that they created themselves in order to trap countries like Greece. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's a beautiful situation, actually. It's a classic one. It, it gives you a, a, a wonderful set conception of how, um, how many errors and ha uh, have been made and how all of these errors accumulate and build on each other uh, and create you create for you an impossible situation. Now, this is a relatively minor affair, which, as I said, will eventually be sorted out. But before very long, uh, there will be some far more serious problem where the EU will run up against all its old problems of its misconception of its importance and of the fundamentally bizarre structures that it has created. And then, of course, when that major crisis comes, it will be in serious trouble. Yeah, two quick questions. Does Russia uh, care what the EU does at this point, what they decide? These leaders, the EU leaders, what they decide, does Russia really care? Say they say no, Russia will just take its ball from the playground and, and go play somewhere else. Is that your, is that your hunch? That's number one. And uh, number two, uh, countries like Lithuania, the Baltic states, um, Latvia, Estonia, and then you have the Netherlands uh, throw in Poland. Do you think the forces behind these countries, these world leaders that are that are raising such a fuss about this, these are forces that are coming from, say, the deep state, neocons, neolibs, five eyes. You know, we just had the other day the uh, what happened with uh, the uh, the UK and the Black Sea and uh, the forces that were probably at work there to get that uh, that destroyer into the Black Sea and cause a, a bit of a, of a shake-up there with Russia. Do you think those are the same forces that are telling people like Root, you know, look, 
you are going to oppose this. You're going to raise a stink about this. You're going to cry about this. And you're going to uh, try to, uh, to stop any rapprochement between Germany and France with Russia. Right. Well, first, let's talk about the Russians. The Russians will uh, have al already decided that they were going to shift their ball to another court many years ago. They were already edging towards doing that, by the way, before the Ukrainian crisis. They could see the direction that things were going. One of the reasons that they were able to insulate themselves so well from the sexual sanctions was that they'd already, to a great extent, prepared for them. So already before 2014, they'd made that decision, that they'd made that big strategic decision that they were going to rebalance trade towards countries, well, primarily China. They'd already made that decision because they could see what kind of language was coming out of Brussels and they could, they, they, you know, they, they can read, they can read European newspapers and what European leaders say. So that's one thing. But they will nonetheless, I think, want to have at least a more balanced situation in, in, in Europe simply because they don't want to worry about it all the time. I mean, this is, this is, the, I mean, it, Time is a resource in itself, and all the time Putin and Lavrov and Shoigu and Mishutsin, you know, the Russian leaders, have to spend, you know, worrying about what Angela Merkel might do from one day to the next. Is time wasted on more important things? And this is a thing people just don't understand. I mean, it's, it's vitally important for the Russians that, you know, they're able to focus on their own very, still very great internal problems and on forging their own internal, uh, um, you know, building up their eco internal economy and building up their trade links with other countries and doing all those things. So they want quiet. What they want, I think, in Europe, if they can get it, is peace and quiet. I think it's even more important to them in some ways than trade is. Having said that, I think that they also recognise that the chances of them getting peace and quiet in Europe is probably, um, you know, they're not overly optimistic about it. And if at the end of the day things continue as they have, well, they'll put up with it because they've already shown that they can do and they will still be able to spend most of their time dealing with all of these other problems. So they'll shrug their shoulders. If the EU can't get its act together, they will shrug their shoulders and they will continue as they already have. And in the meantime, if the uh, EU does want to calm things down well they would they're ready for that too they would welcome that too for the reason i said but they will do it on their terms they're not going to make give an inch on ukraine they're not going to give an inch on belarus they're not going to give an inch on moldova they're not going to give uh, any conceivable way they will agree to some of the projects that were being floated in the eu in the 90s and early 2000s about getting eu companies to develop you know, by themselves, Russian oil and gas fields and all that sort of thing. The Russians, that's absolutely out of the question. And from their point of view, they've already won all the major points they wanted to make, and they're not going to retreat from them at all. Real quick, Alexander, your thoughts on uh, the sanctions against Belarus. Very quickly, once again, you have EU trying to project this, uh, this strength this show of strength by sanctioning uh, more sanctions on Belarus. We already have so many restrictions being put on Belarus already. Um, I, I, what, what are your thoughts there? Well, first of all, these are extraordinarily wide sanctions. These are sectoral sanctions that target large sectors of the Belarusian economy and which will in effect drive them further towards Russia. That's the first thing they're going to do. They're going to make Belarus, oblige Belarus to integrate its economy ever more deeply into China's and Russia's economic system. So that's, that's the effect. But the thing about these sanctions is that, again, it's fascinating to see how that whole process of sanctions began. Because a few years ago, the EU was courting Lukashenko, who was the president of Belarus, and they were lifting sanctions against him. And they were trying to pull him away from Russia with all sorts of inducements. And when it became clear that that wasn't going to happen, they started this slow build-up of sanctions. Firstly, there were going to be sanctions against his officials. Then there were going to be more sanctions against uh, uh, some more of his officials. And now, of course, we've ended up with sectoral sanctions. Now, 
I have to say, this trajectory of travel for, you know, these kind of overwhelmingly big sanctions that they're now imposing, it does make me wonder now whether that whole incident with the Ryanair flight wasn't in fact staged on purpose in order to provoke those sexual sanctions. Because um, we'd been hearing from countries like Germany until just a few weeks ago that they opposed those sanctions. They thought they would be counterproductive. They thought that they would drive Belarus deeper into Russia, uh, into the hands of you know the Russians. And what changed? Well, that flight changed, it seems, everything. And that that doesn't seem like that, that 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 suggests to me that perhaps given the fact that there was always this sanctions pressure and this pressure to increase the sanctions all the time, I have to say that it did seem to me it does seem to me now much more likely than it did before that this thing was staged in order to achieve that effect. And you asked the previous question about the connection of the deep state to some of these hardliners. Well, of course, there is a profound connection. I mean, uh, certainly, especially, dare I say it, in the Netherlands, which is the location of many of these institutions that exist there. You know, the, 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 the uh, international institutions, which are ultimately deep state institutions, if I can say that. Um, it, it seems to me that that seems to be part... Of the, of the overriding and ultimate process that has led to this. So uh, that whole incident now looks increasingly as if it was staged. Yeah, but very quickly, the, the goal of the sanctions is to regime change Lukashenko. Will it, will it work? No, it won't work. It will do the opposite. As I said, it will consolidate Russian control over Belarus. It will make some people in Belarus extremely unhappy. But Lukashenko now looks like he's in firm control and the Russians are determined to keep him there. So it's, in fact, made it more difficult to change the government in Belarus. <laughs> That's the effect that sanctions always have. But some people find the obsession they're obsessed with sanctions and they carry carry on with them even though as i've discussed many times in all kinds of venues sanctions like this are actually illegal because they usurp the power of the un security council which is the only institution under international law which is authorized to impose sanctions under chapter 7 of the un charter <laughs> but there we go it's like an attempt again to show how powerful you are, even though in reality you achieve your, the opposite. The British have an expression, you cut your nose to spite your face. And that's what this is. Yeah. What was it? 27 broken, bankrupt member states imposing sanctions on another country. That's, that's the essence of, of well, the indeed. European Union. Well, indeed. <laughs> and and, 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 and a, aiming, to, aiming to hurt the people of that country, because that's what these sanctions will do. <laughs> I mean, Meanwhile, they go on about human rights. I mean, yeah, all right. I mean, bear in mind, one <laughs> okay, of the, Ursula just, 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 and Michelle. I mean, just, just to note, one of the major sectors that's targeted in these sanctions is Belarus's IT industries. Now, the kind of people who are involved in Belarus's thriving IT sector are, of course, the young professionals. Who, who the West was trying to court at one time. And now they're not involved in any of this. They're being bludgeoned. <laughs> it's a, you know, tells you a lot. Look East, Belarus, look East. That's all Absolutely. I can say. Absolutely. No. The West is the West is done. Look East. Absolutely. All Absolutely. right. We'll leave it there, guys. Go to our locals page. And uh, check us out on the Duran shop. 10% off when you use the code Real News. Take care.